Our next, our next speaker is Marco Calabria, um, and he'll be talking about interference and facilitation in phonological encoding. Um, it looks like he's ready. Uh, over to yeah. you then. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm talking about the results of a study that we did in Barcelona, uh, in which we investigated the role of phonological context on, on naming and on, on naming deficit in patients with bilingual aphasia. We tested a Catalan Spanish uh, a bilingual uh, patient with aphasia and her to control. So according according to uh, the two-step model of lexical access, we can explain uh, word find deficits in patients with aphasia. Uh, by uh, either uh, semantic impairment or chronological impairment. It is any deficit in the activation or inhibition of semantic representation or the phonological unit may have a connection uh, with the lexicon and this is uh, uh, the origin of the deficits in lexical retrieval in patients. The evidence that uh, semantic context is influencing the naming retrieval in uh, health individuals, in, specifically in patients, uh, comes from uh, the study uh, which investigates this issue with the uh, second naming task. In this task, uh, typically, we ask participants to uh, name a picture and we present the same picture several times. And what we uh, see, if you look at the uh, naming latencies, we see uh, that there's a facilitation after the second item repetition, and this facilitation can uh, go further uh, across uh, um, the, the, the next cycle for repetition. Uh, for the third and fourth, typically, uh, we use for repetition. However, uh, when we present the same item in the semantically related context, this is among other members of the same uh, category, for example, animal, Marco, we see that, yeah? Marco, your slides are not moving. Can you check that? Are you in your first slide still? Did you see the first slide here? Yeah. Have you moved this on? Is the second? No, we can't see the second. Oh, so. Yeah. Now? Now it's fine, yes. Ah, sorry. Okay. So I go. So as I was, uh, I was saying, in this paradigm, you see a facilitation from the first to the second repetition of the same item when the, the pictures are presented in uh, uh, semantically unrelated conditions, let's say, uh, with pictures with different uh, semantic category. However, when you present the same pictures uh, among uh, uh, members of the same uh, uh, semantic category, for example, animal, we see a facilitation in naming latencies, but this facilitation is no longer there uh, from the third or fourth uh, repetition of the same item. So this difference between uh, in naming latency between the two, these two conditions is usually named semantic interference. And uh, we know from patient studies that is uh, patients uh, show uh, larger uh, semantic interference com compared to uh, healthy controls. And in semantically related condition, uh, patients are more prone to produce uh, uh, error than in uh, uh, heterogeneous condition. Uh, typically, they uh, have uh, error types as uh, uh, omissions or semantic paraphrasia. How this effect are explained in the context of uh, uh, lexical access and the, by the psycholinguistic model? So we have some competitive view that say that uh, the problem is have patients in uh, retrieving uh, names of the, uh, of the picture in this context is due to an exaggerated inhibition of the uh, semantic competitor. So the, the, the spreading of the activation across uh, the member uh, of the semantic network is increased. So it's difficult to reach uh, uh, the, the, the word at semantic at the lexical level. However, some non-competitive view uh, say that it's not a question of inhibition, but instead of activation. They say uh, patients have problems in... Uh, cool. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Again, the slides have not moved on. Now? No. I don't know. Can you just uh, get out? Yeah. Um, we are still, now? Yeah. Can you just try if it is goes down? I mean, try going to the next slide while we are looking at it. Now? Now we can see. If this works, then let's go with this view. Go to the next slide, okay. please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Ah, so I go back. Uh, so, um, uh, so some competitive, non-competitive views say it's a question of activation instead of inhibition. So despite the fact that we have uh, uh, a lot of evidence uh, how uh, uh, semantic content may influence the lexical uh, retrieval, uh, we don't have so much in the context of phonological access. Um, on phonological context on lexical access. Uh, we have some uh, uh, evidence from studies with healthy individuals, and most of the study uh, show that uh, uh, when participants are asked to name teacher in a phonological related uh, context, uh, they are faster uh, compared to the uh, phonological unrelated one. Uh, however, recent evidence from studies uh, by uh, Bengin and collaborators show that this facilitation may convert to interference uh, when we uh, are good in predicting the, the phonological uh, overlap and pattern of this phonological overlap across items. So we can uh, use some um, strategy to predict them so we can modulate the presence of facilitation or uh, inter interference. So the evidence that we have right now are mixed of the, about the effects of phonological context on naming and um, based only on 30 individuals. So the uh, um, study that we, um, that we conducted here in Barcelona, we wanted to uh, look at uh, this relationship between uh, phonolog phonology and lexical access by uh, looking specifically to patients uh, with aphasia, uh, with um, by two main uh, reasons. One is that you know, as we uh, as we have shown in for the semantically uh, semantic cycling uh, naming task, that these patients have refractory deficit at post lexical retrieval uh, when they have to uh, reactivate the words, or there there are some inhibition effects uh, after they have named this feature. So we think that if uh, some phonological effects are there, are uh, uh, more probably to to, uh, to find uh, them on, on, on naming in patient instead of healthy controls. And second, uh, some uh, also suggested that um, patients are less able uh, to implement strategic behavior to uh, predict uh, the pattern of uh, um, the uh, phonological um, overlap uh, in, this, in this naming task. So we think that we, we, we can um, avoid uh, the, the, the aspects that they can explain as uh, some patterns uh, that previously have been found from study with healthy individuals. The second point was that we were interested to look at the, uh, these effects in the context of, uh, of bilingualism, uh, uh, mainly with the idea uh, to test uh, the hypothesis where the, these me mechanisms are based on language-specific uh, processes, and so we uh, may, might expect that uh, two languages are affected in the same way. Uh, otherwise, if we uh, are based on language, not specific mechanisms, we can expect that uh, patients show differential language impairment as, the, uh, um, as um, inhibition may uh, play a role in, uh, in the activation, the activation of, the two, of the two languages. So uh, in the study, uh, we recruited 13 patients with aphasia Marco, and- the, yeah. Sorry to keep interrupting. Um, the slides are not going through, uh, going on. So we are still at slide four. So mm -hmm. do you have two screens by any chance? Sorry. Do you have I two can, screens? I close. I try to. So do it again. Yeah, okay. let's do it again, uh, because uh, the slides are not progressing. So we were at slide four. I'm sorry. That's all right. Don't worry. These things happen. So I try now to open it again. Yeah. So do you see my desktop now? Yes. So do you see the presentation? Yeah. Now go ahead. See? Yes, now that's good. Ah, sorry. So something went wrong. Yeah. Very good now. Sorry. Okay, great. <laughs> so as I was saying, uh, we recruited 13 patients with aphasia and 15 a healthy control with the same age and education and vestibular distribution for language dominance. Uh, in the patient group, we have a variety of official types, but the crucial point here is that all the patients have enormous deficits as measured by uh, the Western official uh, 
battery. So where the, the most important thing for us was that patient had some impairment in electrical uh, uh, retrieval, and uh, uh, all the uh, participants were Catalan and Spanish bilingual, bilinguals, and with early acquisition of the two languages, and uh, both ba uh, balanced use of two languages and high uh, competence uh, in, in, in both Catalan and Spanish. So we uh, defined this specific type of bilingualism with the idea to uh, exclude those people that were uh, uh, unbalanced or late bilingual, uh, just to exclude any effect of uh, linguistic variable in, uh, in determining the language impairment and possibly also uh, the naming um, performance in task. So for the task, we selected two sets of uh, 16 different pictures, two sets uh, uh, for uh, the two languages in order to have four initial phonological overlap that were different between the two languages. Uh, to avoid cross-linguistic uh, effects, and uh, each item was repeated four times, the total number of 128 trials per language. So uh, with this set of uh, stimuli, uh, we uh, designed a four homogeneous block, homogeneous block in which uh, uh, the words have uh, phonological, uh, were phonologically related, and the same uh, item was shuffled in order to have four homogeneous block in uh, um, the same picture, but without any uh, phonological overlap. So uh, four blocks uh, and of homogeneous and four blocks for homogeneous for each language. So if we uh, go to uh, the results here, we uh, plot uh, the uh, uh, naming latencies for uh, the control group for uh, the dominant and non-dominant language. Uh, so the number that you, uh, you see here uh, below are the number of repetition. So as you can see, uh, um, we uh, found significant uh, effects uh, of item repetition, uh, especially the uh, facilitation was larger from the first to the second uh, uh, item repetition. Uh, uh, the, the effect was similar, uh, was the same for the, the two languages, uh, but unfortunately we didn't able to find any effect for the logical context. Uh, um, we didn't find uh, um, that the two conditions, uh, the, the, the name latency for the two conditions were exactly the same. So if we go to the uh, results uh, for patient, we uh, can see that overall patient were uh, slower as expected uh, for the effect uh, of the disease. And uh, uh, we also found uh, in a patient uh, the significant repetition effect that was the same for the two languages. And uh, we didn't find uh, either in patient uh, the effect of phonological context. So uh, patient uh, for naming latencies, uh, homogeneous and uh, heterogeneous condition was exactly the same. But when we uh, moved to accuracy, uh, we didn't find any effect uh, for healthy individuals. But however, in uh, patient, we found that uh, accuracy increased uh, across a trial for the heterogeneous condition uh, when a patient were asked to name uh, phonological related items, but it was not the case for uh, homogeneous conditions. They had uh, a accuracy of the patient in that in those, that condition was, was lower than the heterogeneous condition, meaning that um, for them was uh, more, more difficult to retrieve words uh, uh, of the picture that were presented in this condition. So we found interference instead of uh, 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 facilitation as uh, we expected. So we uh, went also uh, to uh, individual level analysis uh, uh, to check whether uh, this pattern was uh, consistent across individuals and with analysis uh, with the multiply p test, as Arpida just mentioned in her, her talk, uh, we uh, compared uh, the single uh, performance of each, each patient to the control mean, and we found that eight out of uh, 13 patients show this pattern, to say uh, less uh, accuracy in the uh, phonological related condition. So uh, showing that uh, the effect that we found at the group level was, was reliable uh, across uh, individuals. Uh, the same pattern was not uh, so consistent for naming latency. Here we plot the uh, proportional uh, naming uh, latencies uh, between the two conditions. As you can see, seven patients show a significant difference uh, uh, compared to, uh, to, to patient to control, but uh, four of them show facilitation. So the pattern was not so, so consistent. So 
how we can explain all the all, uh, all these set uh, of uh, of results. Um, uh, naming licenses, uh, we didn't find any effects of uh, of uh, phonological context on naming, and uh, we think that one reason is uh, as uh, Brandy and the collaborators uh, uh, um, explain the, the, the data is that we have uh, uh, the the result of the effect on on, on naming licenses due to uh, the sum of two different mechanisms, one uh, that explains the facilitation and, and, and interference, and the presence of uh, these two me mechanisms, it might depend on the, on, the, on the predictability of the phonological overlap, it was not the case in patients. Indeed, uh, they uh, show an effect on accuracy, and we think that uh, this effect uh, is, uh, we can localize this, the, this effect at lexical level as um, the, the analysis of the error of the patient show that most of them uh, produce omission uh, compared to other type of error, and these also demonstrate uh, a kind of uh, feedback connection from phonology at the lexical level, as uh, uh, previously shown according to the two-step model of lexical retrieval. So uh, we think then that uh, a healthy individual uh, can, uh, to some extent, uh, modulate the backing uh, of the connection between phonology and, and lexical according to uh, the experimental situation, but it is not the case uh, uh, for, for a patient. And uh, I, we think that if you want to uh, make a general explanation of the phenomenon, at least in the context of phonology, we might uh, uh, think that non-competitive view of lexical retrieval uh, are, is the best uh, option to explain as uh, um, if we uh, take only the competitive view, probably it's difficult to explain the effect of facilitation that a previous study have found with this type of task. So for what, um, for the results of, uh, um, about uh, the bilingualist effect, we didn't find any effect uh, uh, between uh, the two languages in both uh, uh, health individual and in, uh, in, in patient. So we may conclude that uh, bilinguals rely, uh, at least in, in, in this condition of phonological uh, modulation, uh, uh, in, on the same within language mechanism of lexical retrieval. Say, it seems that, uh, as non-competitive views say, uh, uh, bilingual and monolingual uh, production work, uh, work, work similarly. However, we have to acknowledge that uh, these results uh, um, are uh, probably limited to the type of bilingualism uh, that we study, uh, early and high proficient bilingualism, and also we have to acknowledge that some of the results, or partially the results, uh, can be explained by uh, language linguistic similarity, as Catalan and Spanish are two uh, wrong languages, and we know that lexical level, there's a, um, there's a huge overlap, so in part this, uh, this, this result might be explained for by, by linguistic similarity. Despite the fact that uh, recently, in a review uh, on the effects of linguistic disparity and other double, double variables related to bilingualism show that uh, the linguistic variable is not a key factor in determining uh, the pattern of language impairment in bilingual. Uh, all in all, uh, we think that we, think that, uh, we need uh, more um, replication of, of these studies uh, with this type uh, of task, especially uh, in patients with aphasia, in patients with aphasia with uh, distant language pairs, in order to uh, see whether the linguistic variables are uh, uh, really important uh, to explain uh, these cross language effects. So I would like to uh, thank the coaches and the collaborator uh, of these studies from the speech production bilingualism uh, group from the University uh, Pompeo Fabra, uh, all the participants and the collaboration of the clinician from uh, Hospital San Paolo in Barcelona and the agency for the financial support to uh, this project and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And we've got quite a few questions. I, just a moment. I, Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. So soon Lee, sorry. Uh, soon Lee would like to know if you've conducted a separate analysis according to the types of aphasia that the patients have. Uh, no, we didn't because uh, most of them, seven out 
2013 were anomic, so probably we had there some, 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 an enough number of individuals, but the rest of, for the rest of the type of aphasia was not possible because we have few individuals. But I, just a comment, I can say if we look at the um, individual uh, analysis, we see that um, patients that have different type of aphasia have an interference effect. So it seems that the effect to have uh, uh, more interference, less interference is not dependent uh, on the aphasia type, I would say. Okay. Um, Abhijit Patra uh, says, thank you for the talk. Is it possible to explain these findings from the incremental learning models viewpoint? And if, and would also like to know if there was a difference between the participants with aphasia in terms of their error patterns? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I think that uh, actually uh, in the paper we propose this kind of uh, explanation uh, because I've been given it and collaborators propose the same for the results of interference in, with this task in healthy individuals. And I think is that um, both uh, incremental or other theories that, for example, say this effect on cycling naming task as a differential priming effect between the two conditions instead of interference uh, can explain the results. But um, I think that it's very beyond the general explanation of uh, the effect at theoretical level, I think we have to keep in mind that the uh, prediction is, uh, plays uh, an important role in this task. As we repeat several times the same item, and we have this context for the set, maybe uh, they can modulate, the individual strategy can modulate the performance. Um, I think our Peter has a question which she can ask by video. Yeah, I can't use the chat. Um, so, Marco, some of your participants actually also had um, facilitation, right? So is there a difference between the participants' profile, those who showed facilitation versus those who showed interference? So different profile, you mean? Uh, uh, their linguistic abilities, their type, uh, their um, processing of, you know, phonology or semantics. Well, we didn't check this, actually. Uh, we only just, we didn't check if, those patients have uh, uh, facilitation compared to those have interference have different language, I mean, um, language profile. I mean, no. So, I mean, any other underlying reason why this, there are subgroups of people who behaved in a different way? Uh, no. <laughs> I know, I, I mean, I have no, uh, no idea about it, but maybe, uh, it's been useful to, to check whether um, um, it was a question of aphasia type, but I don't think so, because uh, as numbers show, some of them will be anomic as those that are in the, in the, in the, the show, the interference effect. So uh, from bilingualism, they're very similar. They have very similar profile because we select only people like this. Um, I don't think that, um, I don't know, uh, maybe um, some of them can use some other strategies and show the reverse pattern. Okay, thank you. This is my only explanation. Um, we have a question from Magdalena Jelinska asking what the proportion of women versus men was in your research and is it possible to expect gender-related differences in naming latencies and accuracy, especially in patient groups, do you think lateralization may be an important factor in this context? Okay, so uh, uh, we, I think we have more women than men. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's, I mean, I think that's, that's not an issue. I think gender cannot affect in this case, uh, uh, naming performance. I don't think so. Uh, and uh, lateralization, you mean lateralization of the depth of the of the lesion? They had all left hemisphere lesion, the patient. So uh, we exclude patient 
who had writing is fear lesion. So I don't think it's the question is about it or representation. I'm, I'm not sure that's answered. I'm sure that covers it. Um, okay. I had a couple of questions. Um, yeah. My multitasking of keeping on top of the Q&A and listening at the same time um, was slightly complicated, so I hope this isn't something that you covered. Um, but I was wondering if you looked at any other linguistic variables um, and whether they interacted with the effects that you found, especially uh, things that we know influence lexical access, um, like neighborhood density, frequency. Um, if you control for those, and if so, whether you expect that that might change the balance of mechanisms to show an effect where you didn't find one? Uh, and the uh, frequency was the same between the two conditions, let's say homogeneous and, and, and homogeneous. The length was, was the same. Uh, so most of the linguistic variables was the same between the two conditions within the language. It's quite impossible to do uh, this uh, comparison, I mean, or to keep uh, all the variables, linguistic variables at the same level between the two languages, because sometimes we have normative data that are not comparable between languages. So we didn't, uh, um, we didn't uh, run any analysis on that because uh, we exclude that uh, frequency and uh, other linguistic variable may have an influence as we control that. But uh, yeah, in general, you, we have uh, we, we have uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, uh, influence when you manipulate, for example, a high frequency word like or low frequency word. In in AD patient, for example, uh, bilingual AD patient, we found in previous studies that uh, uh, cognates, for example, are more let's say protected uh, when uh, the disease starts and uh, also low frequency words uh, uh, are um, more difficult to retrieve in these patients, in these patients, especially in the moderate state of disease. Thank you very much. Um, we've still got five minutes. Would you like to say anything about what research you've got planned if you're looking at anything in more detail? Oh, hello? Hello, sorry? Hello. Um, sorry, I was just saying we've still got five minutes and I wondered if you wanted to talk about any future research. Um, me? Yes, sorry. Okay. Um, so, unless uh, anyone else is... Just to say that yeah. this is what uh, we, uh, 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 we did. We have the same uh, study with semantic uh, cycling naming task. It was uh, published last year. So this study was a kind of follow-up to look to, to check uh, how phonological uh, context uh, may influence naming, and uh, indeed we, we, we found similar results if we compare a semantic and, uh, and, and phonology, we, we see that in patients uh, the related condition is always more, more demanding, let's say, and we also run an analysis by comparing the two studies, and we, we saw that ex um, um, uh, interference was even larger in accuracy uh, in the phonological task. So now uh, we are looking to a different issue and we are uh, looking at the uh, how uh, and if uh, uh, bilingual uh, uh, with, with the phasia have problem in uh, gland switching. So we have designed uh, uh, with uh, uh, Nicolas Grund and that is one, one of the culture of this, uh, of this study. Uh, uh, it's a, a task uh, uh, which uh, people and uh, health individuals and uh, and patients with, with aphasia are required to, to name pictures and to uh, freely uh, choose the, the language. And so we are looking at uh, uh, if they are able uh, to do that or to get the pattern more on, the, uh, on one language or the other language. So the answer for the moment is things that if they are playable. So aphasia is something that uh, not always uh, uh, affects uh, the ability to switch between uh, uh, the two languages. But uh, we see uh, some uh, interesting pattern of uh, preservation of some underlying language control mechanisms and the other uh, um, uh, that are more, more affected in patient compared to, to, to control. So at the moment, uh, we are collecting data. On and we do have one last question through the Q&A yeah. uh, from Abhijit Patra saying, um, 
would you expect a difference between participants with stage one impairment versus stage two impairment? So stage one and stage two, you mean acute and uh, chronic stage? If it is the question is that uh, I expect, yeah, I expect differences if uh, is the question about this. We only tested a chronic, I didn't mention that. We didn't uh, only tested chronic aphasia uh, because uh, we need some uh, stable uh, condition in, uh, to, to, to perform, I mean, to, uh, to use this type of task. Oh, sorry, there's a clarification on the question. Um, he meant semantic, uh, stage one semantic and stage two lexical. Uh, we did, uh, uh, if we compare the, uh, the, the data uh, from the two studies that we have, you know, what we did publish on semantic uh, subtly naming and this one with the uh, phonology, uh, we didn't see uh, so much differences. Uh, probably at an individual level, you see uh, some difference, but we don't we don't see uh, great um, uh, dissociation, let's say, between the two level of linguistic processing. So my quest, my my view on that is that it's a kind of general mechanism that uh, uh, we are we use uh, in uh, uh, lexical retrieval that applies in the same way to semantic and and phonology. Indeed, if we compare the patient data in the two studies, we see exactly the same. Uh, in the phonology is other for patient than control, but the pattern is, is the same and the same across the two languages if we look at the type of error they, they produce. Thanks very much. Um, 